Excellent. So thank you, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in, in Regsys this year. It's always one of the highlights of ISMB now and an uh, amazing couple days of, of outstanding work. And uh, it's a thrill to get a chance to, to kick it off. Um, over the course of the presentation, advance. Over the course of the presentation, I'm going to take you through some stories of, of genetics cases that uh, we've touched on that have had cis regulatory alterations and leading up to some uh, work that we've been doing, trying to figure out how do we evaluate the, uh, the evidence behind cis regulatory sequences because we've encountered uh, as a field some challenges in the last couple of years as we've looked at some of the work that we've been doing globally. Um, there's been lots of outstanding effort but as is often the case in computational biology, the biology comes around and, and uh, bites you because you, you miss some sort of key aspects uh, along the way. So, so I'll take you through some of those adventures um, along the way. You're gonna see a, a definite pediatric bent on it. I'm based at a children's hospital in British Columbia. Uh, and so my, my colleagues tend to be uh, um, in the clinics and, and working with kids. So you'll definitely get that sense in the rare disease space that I, that I live in. But the primary space, as, as Julia recommend, noted, is that uh, I've been interested in transcription factors for a very long time. Um, this concept that cells can um, produce amazingly diverse cellular phenotypes from the same set of instructions has been a, a, a challenge that I've found exciting since uh, the 1980s, uh, so before most of you were born, uh, and uh, in a chance to see how far we've come as a field in our understanding of transcription factors and, and the regulation of genes. So I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit since it's the kickoff of the Rexis session. I'll mention a few sort of field uh, broad comments. Uh, I won't go too long on that. Uh, and then we'll, we'll dig in along the way. So I think it's important uh, to think about the context that we work in. And so many of the tools and methods that we use have actually been around for a very, very long time. So if you, you look back over some of the milestones in our field of, of regulatory biology, um, DNA's footprinting, which essentially is uh, the predecessor of DNA hypersensitivity analysis, uh, was described in 1978. Uh, position weight matrices that still remain a, a substantive working tool within our system, even though we've got outperforming models now, um, were in their modern form really there in 1982. Uh, the CELEX type experiments for doing a large scale screening of, of uh, diverse libraries came around in 1990 and our genome draft in 2000, uh, depending on what you, you proclaim as the first chip seek somewhere between 2005, 2007 range. And um, in the Canadian context, uh, the CIFAR form of deep learning that we all love so much now uh, came along in 2006 roughly uh, with some key advances. And in the more recent times, using RNA tags to call regulatory regions, um, you know, the Phantom Project published in 2014 with the, their efforts to describe enhancers. And also in 2014, we saw whole genome sequencing for $1,000 US. So that sort of history there uh, gives you a sense of where we stand now in 2020. Uh, without regards to pandemics and other awful aspects of the year, uh, is that we have a great capacity to produce data, uh, to compile data in large forms, to represent uh, information about transcription factors, to use deep learning methods to dig in and explore them. Um, and so increasingly now, it's not the computation capacity or the data capacity that's gonna limit us. It's gonna be increasingly our capacity to understand the biological systems that we're looking at and incorporate that understanding of the biological systems into the computational methods we develop. And that's something I've tried to, to use along the way in my career and I'll, I'll hopefully touch on a little bit of that as we go on in the next few minutes. So over the last uh, few years, um, and this is always scary when we talk to, to the trainees uh, in this way, uh, we've done an awful lot. So uh, there's been some mountains that we've, we've been working on uh, for a while. So depending on how you, you proclaim it, uh, right now we can pretty well identify all the regulatory regions that are active in a cell uh, using the technologies that are, are available to us. We can identify the transcription factor binding sites in those regions. We can look at genetic variations uh, and we can overlay those with those, those regulatory regions. 
we can perform some amazingly diverse uh, enhancer and promoter assays, either massively pr massive promoter assays or um, some cool methods for using CRISPR technologies for screening through, through enhancers. We can derive motifs and, and properties of sets of functionally similar sequences. We can do some work on systems and network analysis of the genes that act together. Uh, and this year, we can even do some really cool things uh, with visualizing DNA moving on, on uh, or transcription factors moving on DNA. It's some cool work that Johan Elf's been doing for years, but uh, had some milestones this year. So we've done an awful lot, but I think it's always important uh, for the trainees to know that we've only begun to touch on the challenges that we have in front of us. And so the work that uh, has gone on for the last uh, 40 years uh, sets us up for, for even more work, uh, as is the nature of, of research. So just some of the things that I think we're going to be facing in the next uh, next while, and you're going to hear a number of talks along the way in the in the uh, sessions that are going to touch on this. Um, we need to be able to accurately predict how genetic variation impacts gene expression. So we have a lot of work to do there. We need to understand how transcription factors interact together to drive expression. Uh, because individual binding sites aren't the story. You really need to understand systems. If we do that well, we should be able to design on principle regulatory sequences to deliver expression patterns that we're interested in seeing. We should be able to uh, begin to explore temporal transitions. So rather than state by state uh, analyses, we should be able to start thinking about uh, cells in a temporal fashion along developmental and uh, environmental time courses. We can begin to look at more deeply now into the structure of the nucleus and the chromatin architecture and how that uh, relates to all the problems that I just mentioned. And all sorts of other problems that I probably have looked over that may be your passion uh, individually uh, that remain for us to, to work on. So don't uh, despair. All the cool, cool problems aren't gone. There's uh, lots of good stuff to come uh, in the next little while. Now I'm going to take you into to my world, which tends to be uh, the intersection of gene regulation and rare disease diagnosis. And we've seen over the last uh, years uh, adoption of genome sequencing everywhere. So the Global Alliance uh, for Genomics and Health now has driver projects pretty much everywhere around the world. Uh, and these projects have been for years now producing um, reliable, valuable results in diagnosing rare diseases. Uh, and compiling disease genes uh, uh, broadly. My own um, sort of exposure to this is, is, and this is really dangerous when you get into things at the early stages, is that if you have some early success, you think it's easy. So we had some early success and we, we got in and we um, worked with um, some patient populations in our world uh, looking at uh, metabolic diseases. Uh, and metabolic diseases are really the easy spot, and it turns out in, in the rare disease diagnostic space, you have a really defined phenotype, you have a good space to look at, and you can really dig in and study genes that are likely to be causing the disorder until you uh, pinpoint the, the functional changes that, that matter. And so at the protein coding level, you know, we, we can just sort of read them off uh, pretty easily in the, that space, and uh, we had some success rates on the scale of, of 60 to 70%, which is astronomical compared to other more diverse pools of, of disease populations. Um, so uh, you're gonna hear me talk about a little bit of the challenges of having uh, things that are too easy uh, come before you, but not everything's easy. So we had one gene in there that was um, particularly problematic for us to, to work on it. This is uh, one that wasn't in that original study, but uh, it was published last year. And this is the first of three examples I'm going to give you of, of cis regulatory alterations uh, rather than protein coding changes. Um, and in this case, we had a patient who had glutaminase deficiency. So the phenotype was pretty clear, uh, but we needed to get to a genetic understanding of what was going on. Um, the glutaminase deficiency is generally caused by mutations in the GLS gene. And when we got in there and looked at the, the gene, we found in, in our first family that we had a, a, a and it's, it's uh, recessive, so you need to knock out both, both alleles. Uh, and so when we sequenced in, we found a mutation in one allele, but the other allele, we didn't find uh, any protein coding alterations. And so uh, that gets me enthusiastic because then I can start looking for cis-regulatory events. And, and my great student, Phil Richmond, who did the sort of driving efforts on this, uh, went in and we just couldn't find it. And we were looking around uh, intensely 
uh, for what was going on. And so I'm going to cut a long story short here because I want to keep time for, for the rest of it and it's published with the link that's there. Um, but what we found was a, a triplet repeat expansion in the five prime UTR of the gene. Uh, this wasn't coming up on our normal genome processing. It was too long an expansion to be seen easily in the reads that we had, no long read technology in this particular case. Um, and what we found was that that triplet repeat expansion uh, was resulting in an epigenetic silencing of the uh, of the allele with the repeat expansion. And then uh, because the global community of, of people working with kids with uh, metabolic disorders is small, uh, we were lucky and we were able to find additional families around the world that had uh, also glutaminase deficiency that hadn't been discovered and identified uh, triplet repeat expansions uh, in a number of other cases around the world um, of these kids. When we came time to try to publish it, uh, we got some challenges as the nature of publishing, and you're going to hear me talk about that a little bit as well as we go along, is that these regulatory variants are often very hard to get into the literature. So it's hard to, to get uh, multiple families. It's hard to get conclusive evidence and some of the experimental techniques. You don't know what cells or tissue to work in all the time, and many times those cells and tissues aren't really available. So they're, they're difficult. It's not impossible, but they're difficult to, in many cases to get to the literature. Um, one of the challenges we had here was we needed to get a sense of how common these repeat expansions were in the population. And so this was an amazing effort with partnerships um, across Canada and with Illumina around the world. Uh, and we were able to get our uh, hands on data from thousands of, uh, of cases. And what we saw was that the distribution, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the distribution in the bottom center of the screen um, of the repeat expansions indicated that generally you had 20 repeats or less. In our patients, we were seeing upwards of uh, hundreds to a thousand uh, repeats. So clearly the, these patients were rare um, and they were on the outside extreme of the, of the repeat number. So that was reassuring as a case that worked. We had a regulatory event, um, we had silencing and, and we got a lot of collaboration and work to, to bring that forward into the literature. Uh, but again, it's not always that easy. Now, as a field, uh, we get informed by the, the amazing stories that stand out in our eyes. And so over the last number of years, we've seen uh, in the cis regulatory variation space, two stories that tend to get highlighted all the time uh, in our field. And they're great work, uh, not mine, uh, great work in the field. Uh, one is looking at the TERT promoter, which is probably textbook level now information where we have uh, looking at cancers, sequencing for variants, and we find uh, alterations in a, a, a regulatory element in the TERT promoter. Uh, and the other set that we've seen a lot of is in the sonic hedgehog uh, enhancer, where alterations uh, relate to polydactyly and other sort of uh, developmental disorders um, of limb characteristics. And these are now um, uh, constantly looked at and referred to and, and often used as exemplars in our papers when we describe our interest in doing better work on computational methods for, for regulatory sequences. But these are extremes. And so we don't see these uh, popping up all the time. Uh, we tend to think of them that, in that way, uh, but they, they are um, not the norm. Uh, and so as we uh, go forward in our world, um, we see more challenging cases. So, you know, in the naive uh, universe that I live in, I thought, well, when we were doing our work early on in this space, well, maybe it'll just be easy. Maybe we can just take Jasper, which is the good old reliable database that my, my labs had the pleasure to work on for a lot of years. Uh, and we can take those collections of, of PWMs and we can scan sequences. Now, this is despite my, my statements that PWM predictions are nearly worthless uh, in terms of uh, reliability and that you have to add additional information to them in order to, to get something informative. But even with that, maybe we could do some, some good work. And so uh, several years ago, uh, we had a case that worked out pretty easily um, and, and nicely. So this was a, a case with a, a population of patients, so Huntington's disease patients not pediatric. Uh, and these Huntington's disease patients, uh, we were looking at why were the patients deviating from the age of onset expectations. So we had some people at the extremes of the uh, predicted age of onset, which is based on the triplet repeat expansion length in Huntington's. Um, why were they showing earlier or later onset? And so one of the things we found there 
was that there were alterations in an NF kappa B binding site uh, in the promoter region of the HDT gene. Um, and depending on which allele uh, those uh, variations appeared in, you would have a distinction in the age of onset. And so it was bidirectional because the Huntington's normal function is a, a protective uh, gene. So in this case, if you reduced expression of Huntington wild type, you were more susceptible to, to uh, uh, neural death. And if you altered, if you elevated the uh, um, disease allele of the Huntington's gene, you had elevated toxic toxicity and so accelerated uh, neural, neuronal death. And so you had um, uh, a chance to really see that on both ends of the, the uh, age of onset extremes, uh, we could find a, a significant enrichment for these uh, regulatory alterations in, in nf cap b And that was, uh, again, challenging to get the literature at the time. So how do you get enough evidence for that? And you, you keep pushing it. And it, it made me start thinking about what are the challenges that we're facing here getting these into the literature? How many of these things are sitting in people's cupboards of these interesting cases that they just can't quite bring them uh, enough to bear uh, to bring them to literature? And my suspicion is that we are not uh, unique in how challenging these are to get to the literature and that we probably as a community have encountered a number of these that are sitting around not quite getting to closure uh, uh, to bring forward. So we started um, looking at some of the uh, predictive methods um, for uh, calling regulatory variants. And Phil Richmond, the same student who did the nice uh, GLS story that I mentioned, uh, had been early on in his thesis work uh, looking at some of the methods. And what we started to, to note was that all the methods when we took them, if we looked at these regulatory regions like sonic hedgehog in this case, what we saw was pretty much every position within these regions were being predicted to be functionally important by the methods. So this idea that you have these methods that are supposed to be calling functional variants, but when you come in here and you have conservation and you have uh, some other indications of, of function, these methods were pretty much uh, saying every position was equally important, whether they were pathogenic uh, in the lower panel with the stars or just normal nomad variants that happened to be there that had no indications of pathogenic impacts. Uh, the, the scores that were being assigned were really pretty consistent across them. So this um, seemed like we were not sort of computationally in the method uh, getting to where we, we wanted to be. And when we looked at the correlations between the, some of the tools that were available at the time, what we found is that they were generally highly correlated to one another. So we weren't getting much difference. And so that was an internal to the lab. That's something we've never published. Uh, and partly the reason that we never published it is because uh, Kircher et al. Uh, last year published a beautiful story that tells the same, same idea. And so uh, in this, uh, this study, um, which uh, deserves uh, a lot of uh, attention, uh, they did a CRISPR screen on 20 enhancers systematically altering all the positions in the enhancers and characterizing the impacts of those, those alterations on expression. And what they saw, um, and this is from, from the Kircher paper, what they saw was that a relatively small number of positions in these regions were, were functionally impactful, so that you had most of the positions tolerated change quite, quite well. But when you looked at the methods for predicting, and generally they did very badly. Um, and so it was systematically poor, poor on our ability to predict which of these regions were functionally uh, important. Um, the panel on the lower right was a, a look at uh, some of the different methods uh, that were being used to predict uh, functional alterations. And what you should walk away with from there is the same one that the message I just gave you on the last slide, which is that these methods are extraordinarily correlated in their predictive characteristics. Uh, the only one that's a little bit different here, uh, and it performed equally badly, just to be clear, uh, it was Jasper. Uh, and the reason for that is that Jasper is just using motifs where almost the other ones are using conservation as a, a filter. So you have pretty much conservation driving most of your, your methods um, to, to score what's going on. And as I said, uh, systematically calling functional health positions uh, in conserved regions. So that left us at a point where we didn't really have great computational methods to reliably go and call functional elements uh, within the system. And so as a field, uh, when you look across each of those columns there, think about the amount of energy and time and effort that's gone in uh, within our community. Uh, there's been probably 50 different 
projects developed around let's make some functional predictions of functional alterations uh, in regulatory sequences. And if they're not doing that much better than conservation, we, we need to do some better jobs in our, our field getting data to, to help those people train and develop their methods. So I'll take you to the third story uh, to motivate uh, some additional work here. And I'm just watching the clock as we go along. Uh, so this was a case at BC Children's Hospital. We had a patient uh, emerge who um, uh, had strabismus, that's an eye misalignment disorder. Uh, what was interesting here was the family reported um, uh, nine generations of transmission of the uh, Mendelian dominant form of strabismus, so it doesn't normally transmit that way. Um, we did all of the normal genetics workup. We did linkage analysis, uh, lots of partners on this, uh, mapped out a three megabase uh, region uh, that was responsible for uh, clearly the signal for the, the region there. Uh, when we went and looked at that three megabase region, uh, we could map it down and look at the TAD uh, boundaries and characteristics around it and uh, do whole genome sequencing and see where the variants were. There were no, it's a gene poor region, as you can see. In there and in that gene poor region we didn't have any protein coding changes so it suggests regulatory and when we got in further uh, and you look to see what's there uh, it's a gene called FOXG1. Uh, FOXG1 is a forkhead transcription factor uh, and so and there's a syndrome called FOXG1 syndrome of which essentially every patient has strabismus so in this case we've got what looks like an alteration in the FOXG1 locus it's causing strabismus. It's not causing the rest of the phenotypes found in FOXG1 syndrome. So it's isolating the strabismus aspect of it. When we went further, the, the likely uh, causal variant in our eyes, uh, though it's hard, hard to be conclusive at this stage, was a four base pair deletion. Uh, that four base pair deletion is in that striking ultra conserved region that you see uh, uh, in the middle of the screen uh, now um, that's conserved back to lamprey in our system. And moreover, when you look at that four base pair deletion and you zoom in, um, it's sitting at uh, two overlapping FOXG1 binding sites. So this would be a predicted case of auto-regulation of the gene so it's that the FOXG1 transcription factor is produced from the FOXG1 gene. It, it comes around, it binds to the promoter of the gene uh, and acts to regulate it. So that's the model. Uh, we don't know what cells it's doing that in because uh, there's a variety of places it could be happening. We don't know at what developmental stage it's happening. Um, but that's the, the expectation. Can we prove it? Not really yet. So it's uh, going to need additional work to, to bring that. Um, things like modeling strabismus in mice is difficult. So it's, uh, it's an interesting problem to, to work on. So, but that led to a question of how do you bring something like this to the literature? So how do you bring it out? You've got no additional family. You've got nothing else other than a, a great linkage peak and a, a, a good story that makes sense. Um, and so we started looking around the literature a lot, and it, it led us to an observation that I think is relevant to us as a community about where do we go and find easier spaces to find regulatory alterations. And that's that this idea of altered regulation of master genes uh, is really impactful. It's powerful phenotypically. And so if you look at something like sonic hedgehog, even though it's not a transcription factor, it is a very powerful early developmental gene. Um, and so it led us, uh, to, to do a bit of an exploration because we kept finding in the literature as we dug around uh, variants, functional variants in transcription factor genes. And so it led us to this idea of deregulated regulators. So is this a place that we can have some, some easy uh, fruit to, to pick in terms of functional changes in, in cis regulatory alterations? Uh, so this is some great work of two postdocs in my lab, Robin Vanderlee and, and Solin Craig. Uh, and Robin and Solen uh, dug in and uh, started exploring what was out there in the way of, of evidence for functional alterations in transcription factor genes. They found 46 in the literature, uh, so 46 distinct variations, variants that have been described that had functional alterations. Um, they are located all over the place. So this diagram shows some in UTRs, some in introns, a bunch in proximal promoter regions, some upstream. Nothing immediately downstream, I don't know why. Uh, so that may just be sampling or it may be something else, uh, but most of the functional changes uh, that we found were first, a fair number of them were large uh, deletions. Um, so those were uh, system, but a, a large number were, were small scale changes that you can see displayed on this, this diagram. Um, 
And we could see uh, when we went back and looked at transcription factors in general, um, that uh, transcription factors are enriched amongst hapless insufficient genes. That's not surprising. They contain fewer loss of function variants. And so this is a place that you would expect to find uh, an enrichment of, of functionally important changes. So it, it made sense. We looked at all of these variants. And so we went to the various tools that we had, looked at what data was available and how much evidence there was. We looked at all the papers describing them and what evidence they had along the way, trying to get a sense of what is the, the threshold by which we can put these in the literature and uh, to determine that they are, are functionally important. And that led us to uh, come up with a semi-quantitative uh, scoring system so that people can basically take the evidence lines that are available um, and uh, apply them to that. And we, we broke those into two categories. We broke them into to clinical evidence. So what's the evidence that this is a clinically important uh, situation? and functional evidence. So what's the evidence that's disrupting uh, transcriptional regulation in some way? So these, these two systems, we, we spend a lot of time, I feel we think it's a, think it's a useful uh, set of, of measures for people. Um, and then here's all of the variants in the um, different clinical and functional evidence categories for what evidence is there. Um, and you can see in the plots below uh, over time uh, on the lower right, how the evidence uh, has compiled for these different uh, uh, cases uh, from when they were first out to their current scores. So we think that's useful and, and I'm hoping that uh, people will take a chance to, to push in on the, the master regulators and really look at the functional variants that are there because I think that's a place that we can get enough data to actually inform and train and develop some of the tools that we need to have so to get out of just having highly correlated conservation predictors. Um, so where do we go from here, uh, since this is a, a keynote, and I think I'm getting towards the end of my, my time, but I've got a few more things I'd like to push forward. Um, so we need to discover more regulatory variants that are causal for disease, uh, so that we can inform and develop our algorithms better. Uh, we need to, from that as a field, we need to understand the control pathways uh, so that we can modulate uh, gene activity. So a lot of the things we're seeing is desires to be able to change the expression of these genes um, and can have therapeutic benefits. We need to be able to go towards, we can deliver therapeutic uh, expression of the genes. We have to deliver targeted expression, which means we need to develop our capacity with promoters to do that. And we need to be able to modulate transcription factor activities for cell differentiation, because that's gonna be key to our, our ability to, to develop these regenerative protocols. So as a field, those are some of the things I think we'll be spending a lot of time on in the next few years. As is the like in, in uh, Regsys uh, presentations, I will throw a couple advertisements up there uh, in the system. So German Novikovsky is doing a poster in the Regsys poster session. Uh, and he's been using a deep learning based approach uh, incorporating transfer learning uh, to improve prediction of uh, transcription factor binding motifs uh, on data. And it's, uh, it's really nice work and it uh, highlights that with a transfer learning based approach, uh, you can really cut down the amount of training data that you need to, to work on transcription factor binding sites. And I won't spend much time on the rest of the advertisements. Um, we have some tools for embedding functional changes in genomes so that you can develop your tools better. Um, We've been working on compact promoters to try to drive expression in selective patterns. This is a deregulated regulator case with the PAC6 gene. Um, and uh, one half of my lab is working heavily on uh, working with the indigenous communities of Canada to develop background genetic uh, data so that indigenous communities are not at inequity, inequity in terms of rare disease diagnosis. So side pieces that are, are not directly relevant. Uh, work like this doesn't happen by me. In fact, none of it happens by me. All of it happens by uh, an amazing team of people. Um, I've mentioned uh, Robin Vanderlee, who just uh, recently went to Absolera, which is doing cool COVID work. Uh, Solan Carrard, who's doing, uh, is really lead on the silent genomes. I mentioned Phil Richmond, who did some of the work that's there. The uh, strabismus work uh, was done by Cynthia Yi, and um, uh, the, uh, Gene breaker work that I mentioned is being done by Tamara Afshalom. So good work there. So as we move into the, the question period, um, I'd like to do it also as a common thing in Rakes' talks, which is to say that I'm hiring. And so anyone who wants to come find uh, Vancouver, which is one of the beautiful places on earth, uh, is welcome to come there. And just be, in addition to being a beautiful place on earth, 
we have the world's best uh, public health officer uh, and amazingly low COVID rates. And uh, we love Bonnie Henry so much that we've created uh, special shoes and beers and others in her honor uh, because we feel very protected in our, our little world. So uh, come join us, it's safe. And I'll turn it back to Julia for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Wyatt, for a great talk. I enjoyed the journey from the past to the future. So I think it really sets nicely the tone. And I do have a couple of questions already. Uh, so the first question from the Q&A is from uh, Jan Grau, and the question is, I could imagine that deletions or insertions may have a stronger impact than single nucleotide exchanges on transcription factor binding. Could you comment on this intuition? Is it correct from your experience? It is. It's, uh, if you take uh, any of these uh, prediction scoring systems, and it, just even the most basic level, and take Jasper matrices and score with, what you see is that the uh, ability to alter the, the strength of the uh, d disruption is tremendously higher for, for insertions and deletions. So if you think about from an information content perspective and you think about how much information content we have in a motif and you disrupt one position at one nucleotide, you sort of have a maximum of two, uh, two points that you're going to change there, uh, two bits of information. But if you put an indel in the middle of a motif, you can have an impact of on the scale of, of seven to ten uh, bits of information. So, uh, from purely from a computational standpoint, uh, it's massive, and indels are much more likely to be impactful. And so, just a follow up question for me: So, is it is it actually usually like that that you have only a single nucleotide exchange versus a deletion insertion, or do you sometimes see two nucleotides changed? Is that or is that rare? We we see them. It's uh, it's more common to see a single nucleotide uh, change. So a, 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 an alteration of a single nucleotide is much more common in the data that we have, but it's it's not rare. So we still see a lot of uh, of small indels. Uh, and you think about the the biochemical machinery, uh, it makes sense that you can see that there's a lot of of stuttering and slipping and, and the like. Uh, the machinery is great on the scale of billions of bases, uh, but it it does happen, and so. Um, okay. And in terms of cis regulatory sequences, it's probably more important than the single nucleotide changes. Okay, so here I have a couple of questions, so hopefully get through that quickly. <laughs> so uh, next question was, uh, have you seen variants that change the transcription factor binding preference? So in the protein? So in the literature, yes. Uh, not in the, my work, but in the literature, yes. And one thing that we, we looked at a little bit was on that forkhead binding site, the FOXG1, because uh, you think about, is it autoregulation, is it uh, FOXG1, or is it other 4 head transcription factors that are interacting with that site? And in that case, we couldn't uh, sort of conclusively prove that there were there's preferences uh, there. But we know from our own work in the field that it, with the, even within families of transcription factors, there's, there's subtle differences in their binding preferences, and uh, we will shift those uh, with alterations. So the, 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 that was a long answer to yes. <laughs> I see. Okay, so next question is a couple. I hope we get to uh, cover them. Um, have you considered applying your deregulated regulator approach to differences between human and chimp? That's a question from uh, Irene Kapler. So it's a good question. We have not. Um, it, uh, it would make sense to do so because you would think that uh, you should be able to see, uh, see some subtle alterations there. Uh, so, uh, I don't, uh, in Canada, we really don't have any primate research uh, facilities a little bit in, in Quebec. Uh, so maybe for a country that has a little bit more going on in that space. Okay, so next question is, have you come across this transcription factor uh, binding sites present in transposable elements? Is it trickier to predict them? So um, there's a, an amazing, uh, um, researcher in uh, in Vancouver named Dixie Mager. And Dixie has been uh, working on uh, transposable elements and their role in regulation for a long time. It's not that hard to predict them. So we, we have a pretty good understanding of what the regulatory sequences are. It's very hard to figure out what they're actually doing in the genome in the different spots. So we can find them, we know what is there, but we don't really know if they're functionally active. So the challenge is function rather than prediction. Okay. Um, the next question is, given the fact that conservation scores are not necessarily great predictors of functional relevance, is this an argument for the greater importance of rare variants? 
Um, I've seen that in the literature. So uh, I think conservation can be very powerful in certain moments. So I do think there's places uh, in the genome where conservation is a powerful tool. I, my career was built on some early work on phylogenetic footprinting and, and the importance of that. So I, I, I have some appreciation for conservation. But I do think as we look outside the rare diseases, but into more common situations, a compilation of, of rare events uh, may, be, may be important. So that's, a, that's hedging and dancing because I'm not really sure. Uh, okay, so can you comment on DNA methylation on transcription factor binding sites? And I think that's the last question I'm allowed to ask. So. Yeah, so, so we've seen some really interesting things in the field in the last few years looking at the, the alterations of, of methylation and potentially other uh, changes on DNA. Uh, Michael Hoffman some nice work in that space. And what we can see there is that they are functionally important. Um, and that for me, I just don't have had, I've not had sort of a reliable flow of data looking at those types of changes enough to, to incorporate it well into my system. But from other groups that are doing it, absolutely, that 